becoming highly popularized at that time. I think the farm to table movement was fully in full swing at that moment. Um, so we certainly weren't inventing anything there. But what was fascinating to me is, is you know, as an individual, when you go to a real, a real scratch restaurant, real farm to table restaurant, where the, you see that chef get a whole halibut or get a whole like really butcher or car and get these pieces of proteins and vegetables where they they're true artists and, and, and they're breaking these 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 components down and transforming them. It really opens your eyes. Welcome, food enthusiasts, to this episode of the Future Foodcast podcast. I am so excited with our having our guest today. His name is Fraser Nagy, and he is with Tables, and just an exciting, innovative concept within the industry of food in general. Welcome to the podcast, Fraser. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we want to dive into what's going on with your latest project, but if you wouldn't mind giving us, because you have a rich history uh, in this general industry, if you could tell us how you ended up where you are now, what, what's a little bit about your history? Absolutely. And I'm sure we're going to jump into a few different topics today. So um, we'll, try to, we'll try to compartmentalize this as, yeah, this is certainly Certainly my passion, certainly something that, you know, perhaps, you know, you know maybe I don't believe in, in destiny, but pre, preordained in a certain way. I, I, I'm one of the rare few of this generation that grew up in, you know, rural countryside with, you know, family farm that is still in our family name since 1832 and in, in continuity. So, um, you know, that, that maybe as a child, you didn't quite appreciate what that means, but certainly as an adult to, to have that level of tradition and, and to have a real piece of land that is, is connected um, does make you change the way you look at your food. Um, and, you know, my parents even, I think they were that, you know, they were really early adopters into the farm to table movement at large and, and conservationists and, and, you know, many of the trends we see that are popularized today and in, you know, 2022, they, they were part of those initial concepts in the 90s when, you know, North America was still very, you know, very detached from where our food came from, it was on our plate and the, the rise of these global major superstores that really unfortunately changed our, our, our eating habits for the worse. So with all that in mind, I actually, my very first job was, uh, was a banquet server at a golf course uh, when I was 13. So um, you combine that background with the fact that I've worked in restaurants my whole life, um, you know, and, and then tack on an economics degree, all of a sudden you have quite the uh, trifecta of, of potential, I guess, ho hopefully theoretical and physical application of knowing the industry to, to you know, build out a couple companies. So um, Tables is, is my second company. Uh, our first was Transparent Kitchen, which as a first time founder is always a jumble of learning experiences, highs, lows. Um, and, uh, you know, love to talk about that as well, certainly in line a lot with many of, uh, many of the themes that you love to cover, um, but, you know, tables as we'll get into a little bit later, uh, it, it's, it will really fundamentally change restaurant economics and therefore uh, have that trickle down effect, of course, to, to the whole supply chain, which I, I, I so care about. Well, I think our audience is really going to appreciate the fact that you actually lived in on the land and, and experienced that when at a time when we were really sourcing so locally our food and, and people were eating, like you said, so much better than they are now. But I think where you were, where you've been has really fueled then some of your interests. You're right. You combine that economics degree, the work that you did as a young man, a really young man, I might say, 13 is pretty, pretty young to get started. Uh, I was a waitress in the restaurant industry. I think it gives you just an appreciation for just serving others and, and caring about you know, what, what you're giving people. And it's just a different perspective. If you've never been a waiter or a waitress or a food server of any kind, just gives you a different perspective. I, I love that you're bringing all that to the table. You're no pun intended, right? <laughs> uh, that it is like a trifecta because you have your experience and you have where you, where your family history is, as well as what you've chosen to study. And so your first company, you got started in that because why? What, what was your impetus? I, I love food entrepreneurs. It's so interesting. There's always a passion there or a reason why you even got started in the food. Space. It comes down to some simple, maybe fundamentals, I guess. I, I you know, I've served my whole life, uh, you know, from through high school, through university, 
and and even my server tip money was the seed capital for the first business so uh you know i certainly had dishwashing in there i was in the kitchen for some years and i even helped you know manage an open restaurant so it, it really you know you get to a certain point where you've almost seen it all in, in the space but it really started when i was in university um and this is what's important about transparency there's two fundamental missions that we had at that time in, in 2017 and one was my favorite topic is where your food comes from. And, you know, although it was, it was becoming highly popularized at that time, I think the farm to table movement was fully in full swing at that moment. Um, so we certainly weren't inventing anything there. But what was fascinating to me is, is you know, as an individual, when you go to a real, a real scratch restaurant, real farm to table restaurant, where the, you see that chef get a whole halibut or get a whole, like really butcher or car and get these pieces of proteins and vegetables where they, they're true artists and, and, and they're breaking these, these, these components down and transforming them. It really opens your eyes because it, it's, it, it is a moment. And yet what just absolutely could not, I could not get over was here we were creating, it was this wonderful sort of casual fine dining restaurant, one of the best in the, in the city that I, I grew up in. And yet people would come in our restaurant and, and how, what was the medium for them to learn about their food? Well, this, this, paper menu that we had in the window that was like dirty, um, a PDF on their on our website that they'd have to pinch and zoom. And even when you handed them, certainly a beautiful leather bound menu, which I'm still a huge fan. Of. I don't think I'll ever want tablets at the table. But you know, what is a hal you would say halibut, $36 with peas in a sauce. Like it, there was no concept of the fact that this fish was line caught in the most sustainable way by a fisherman that was, you know, had, was not part of some international conglomerate and that fish traveled all of these miles to make it to this restaurant. And you think of all of the jobs and all the people that fish supported and it was summarized in one little 12 font text with no context. And that just, it just, I could never get over that. Um, and why, you know, our restaurant was certainly busy. Was it sold out every night? No. Was the corporate restaurant down the street sold out every night? Yes, unfortunately. And they were certainly not sourcing the way we were sourcing. So the first company, simply we thought, how could you tell the story of that food? How could you show that food differently? So, you know, with the Instagram culture and all that blowing up, and yet why is our restaurant still using a PDF pinch and zoom that wasn't collecting any user data, wasn't talking about where the food came from, wasn't visualizing that food, and Transparent Kitchen was that. We, we took these menus, we brought them to life. And then the next step there is we actually were sourcing the raw ingredients. So not only could you then go on a restaurant's website, instead of getting a PDF, you would see this interactive menu embedded onto the website. You could also see the halibut dish beautifully shot professionally. We actually invented our own photography system and it was a, a, that was a whole other thing. But you could even see all the raw ingredients that went into that dish. So you can see the halibut, the peas, the carrots, the stock, and what farms or fisheries supplied that. And you know, we discussed earlier, you and I, just the notion that at the time blockchain was just coming about. And our hypothesis was, okay, well, if we work with some of the top restaurants around North America, and all of these people are trying to find these top chefs and top restaurants information, and we start sourcing all of the ingredients to these restaurants, well, guess what? Once these amazing blockchain technologies and some of the first early applications was the DNA certification of seafood. Well, we might actually be in a position because a lot of these companies won't actually have any of the consumer facing application. They'll have all the great tech behind the scenes, but maybe there'll be this perfect marriage. And it was a beautiful ride. We, we um, again, started it with just $18,000 of my server tip money. Um, certainly a lot of beer money at the time but not enough to, uh, to start a tech company. So, you know, it was two years I worked at night serving to pay the engineers during the day and between three and 5 p.m. before I had to go to work, I would go door knock in other restaurants to get them to sign up for this, for this program. And, you know, we eventually did raise some external capital for some great early investors that, that saw that vision. And we ended up working with 400, some of the top chefs in, in from Pacific Northwest, the Midwest to, the Great Lakes, um, you know, cities like Toronto, Seattle, Minneapolis, and and um, we had a one and one and a half million users ended up using it going into COVID, um, but then COVID happened. So, um, you know, love to talk about some of the things that we worked on then, but to to wrap up the story, uh, we ultimately were, you know, Plan A didn't go quite according to plan, but. Plan B, fortunately for all of us, you know, at one time I actually thought I was going to have to go back to the farm and uh, guard it with a pitchfork because we didn't know how bad COVID was going to be in March or in April. So I said, you know, screw this tech. Maybe I just need to protect protect the fields. 
But, you know, fortunately for all of us, um, you know, more opportunity came out of the pandemic, not less. And I think we're all we're all very grateful. Certainly my team and my family is, is in, I think, the collectively society should be, too. Um, but we were able to sell a, por a portion of our, our, of our platform and technology um, to to a payments company at the time. And um, we've used the proceeds of that, took some time off and then actually saw, I would say, an even bigger opportunity present itself with tables. So that's that's the story. Razor, that is a, so much in that story for our audience who loves to talk about trends and innovation in the food space. And even though you have moved on from that, I, I'm sure that you furthered your cause because of all the groundwork you laid with that particular business and all the things you discovered and the exposure, one and a half million users. A lot of what's going on with is is in the food space and, and the education with technology, it's, it's all about getting the information out there. So maybe you have a million and a half more people that have a little window into what's possible and are now gonna be paying attention and they care about where their food came from. It's interesting, we've kind of gone through those cycles, right? Where used to be very much farm to table where people sourced locally and ate and then it got all, corporate and that was the thing to do. And I really feel like we're kind of returning, especially with COVID people and the supply chain issues, people are having to come back, you know, more local, but thank you for doing that. Thank you for $18,000 worth of tip money is a pretty good job. And you obviously said no to a lot of beer in addition, because you didn't spend that money on that. But let's I was taking the bus home. I was taking the bus home after work. That's how you get there. You know, there you great. go. Well, well, let's click it forward and talk about tables and your latest project, the excitement and, and all that's going on there, because you have quite a lot. Let, let's hear what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And, and certainly there's no, uh, you know, in the thread of history, one leads to the other. Um, and so, you know, bringing in, you know, my other background with this, which is economics, in addition to me staring at some of these tables in our dining room and wondering why doesn't that person know what they're, what they're eating? Um, the other big question I used to drive me crazy is that we had this table, table 11. I always remember because it was right beside the fireplace, right next to a big window and everyone wanted it. It was the best table in the house. And people would, you know, as a 20 year old, you know, first bus boy, and they'd come and try to slip me 50 bucks to get the table, right? And then as I, you know, became a server and, you know, managed the best section, you know, I remember, you know, people, our check average at that restaurant was almost hundred bucks and per person. So, people, you know, a couple would come in, spend $200. And as a server, I'd make 18, 20%. And but what dawned on me, and as I learned more and more, our owners were only making 3.3%. So at $6 and 60 cents, right? I made way more than that serving that table. Um, and to, to put this all in a nutshell is that restaurants are simply the last, the last, um, to do what is called revenue management. Right? So they have, that's a combination of premium seating. So, you know, on airplanes upgrading to first class or comfort plus, you know, basketball court side, car rentals, you name it. Every part of the economy has an ability to upgrade your seat. And then now since the eighties, the airlines actually, American airlines was the first ever industry in the world to adopt dynamic pricing. Well, you name it, name one hotel that you can book that is a flat rate every day of the week, nothing. But yet restaurants, imagine you can today, still 2022, you go through a, a traditional reservation system, be it open table, resi, doesn't matter, pen and paper over the phone. You have no ability to pick where you're sitting. And surprisingly, they put you by the bathroom at on Monday at 5 p.m. when it's dead. You're paying the same price to for that seat, which is zero, as it would be at 7 p.m. on a Saturday when there's a lineup at the door. So, you know, when we talk about restaurants being a tough business to be in, absolutely, there's a million reasons, you know, it's a, you know, it's not like you can show up for delay your work and be sick. You have to always be there. But fundamentally, I believe the economics are broken. So um, what we have done, we've created a, a, a beautiful system, a 3D application where we actually 3D map the inside of a restaurant. And people get to now, you know, we curate the tables, those booth seats, those window seats, the bar seats, the patio tables, those, not every seat, just, you know, roughly 20 to 30% of those, that really great real estate in which people can now upgrade their seat. Sometimes it's free. So Monday at 7 p.m. or Mondays, it can be free, but Saturday at 7 uh, can be anywhere from $5 to $50 and to get that seat. And the beautiful part is that 
the consumers win. And, and uh, you know, I, I joke that people used to call me and say, well, you know, what is, can I have your best table? And I think, well, what the hell's my best table? Uh, I, I like sitting at the bar. Um, you know, when I'm out on a, on a, on a date, I want to sit here. If I'm taking my mom out for dinner, I want to sit somewhere else. So um, the best is so relative. We all have our preferences. So consumers, it's definitely a big win for our, for guests, but for restaurants, I think is the biggest win because it's the first ever transaction that has no cost of goods. So, you know, I don't want to pick on anyone in particular, but Uber, I'll gladly pick on you. You know, when Uber Eats takes, you know, says they're increasing your revenue, well, we all know it's, it's a minimum of, of, of 28%, somewhere is up to 40, depending on the promotions. Uh, obviously, it's very well documented that there's no profit in that. But the difference here is when you pay $20 or $30 to upgrade your table, there is zero cost of goods. So if we go back to our example of that table where my old boss used to make $6.60, well, we've just doubled or tripled their profit on that table simply for enabling a guest to have a better experience. Well, let's pause for a second and recognize that it was your observation for ever. Restaurants have always just had, this is our restaurant, and you walked in and the hostess sat you the next open one, or you might request, or if you wanted to sit out on the patio, you might wait longer. They might say inside or outside, but you never, there was never revenue associated with that. And your observation that that is a profit center for the restaurant owner. And you're right, zero cost to provide that additional service to somebody who's valuing one seat over another, which let's face it, all of us do. Nobody wants to sit next to the bathroom, right? But the genius that I'm hearing from you is that I get to decide what's premium to me. Like you said, what's the occasion? Am I, am I on a date with my husband or special significant other? Or am I, am I bringing my kids out for dinner, you know, and kind of want to be out where it's a little noisier? Do I want to be in a quiet corner? Do I want to be, am I on my own? I want to be at the bar talking to other people or uh, as a couple? Genius. I think that's part of the genius here because I use those reservation systems all the time here in Atlanta. You pretty much have to make a reservation. Yeah, uh, especially post COVID because some seating is still limited. So how is this going over? I imagine restaurants are eager to say, yes, please map my restaurant. What reception are you getting? Reception has been great. Uh, we built the, you know, part of the, the product journey is, you know, you got to build the MVP. You got to find those first customers that are willing to take that risk and, and we all know restaurants, it's they're inundated with all these ideas. Some are terrible, some are great. Um, so we tested in, in San Francisco, Miami, and Toronto uh, with some great partners. Um, the response, not only from the restaurants have been super positive, but we actually were, uh, you know, our, our, our hypothesis that people wanted this was overwhelmingly proven. Um, we've seen thousands of upgrades now um, voluntarily. So this is what's so important about it too, is that no one has to pay if you don't want to. Like, so you don't want to pay. It's the same, same, just go through their existing system, pick up the phone, but you have no choice. So, um, you know, we think it's just such a simple and transparent exchange. Both sides win and, and certainly the restaurant gets their profit. We take our percentage, but it's a profit share. So we only make money if the restaurant makes money. And I think when you have those levels of alignment, um, it's, 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 that's when I, you know, these platforms win and, and do really well. Um, but it also has been a very challenging year to launch a technology company in the restaurant space. So, um, you know, every single city had restrictions and requirements. Um, you just think of the difference between the choices of the municipalities between just even Miami, San Francisco, and Toronto, and how they chose to handle restaurant lockdowns. Um, Toronto is in yet its third full lockdown where you can't even dine. Miami, obviously, we know <laughs> it's been a free-for-all. And San Francisco has had very strict restrictions, but has mostly maintained restaurants. But at mixed at only up until this past summer was there, you know, they had 50% capacity and then they had no staff. San Francisco is, you know, California at large, but San Francisco in particular uh, barely could, uh, many restaurants weren't even able to open once they were legally allowed to open. So certainly a trying year uh, to do this. Uh, so we're very grateful for, you know, the, the dozens of partners that started with us and piloted this and, you know, going into this year with, with the data we have, with the reception, with, again, the fact that it doesn't cost the restaurant anything. Uh, it's, a, it's a benefit for both parties. And we're definitely excited for, for, a, for a big year. Yeah, starting off now. 
Fabulous. You know, the revenue share model, I would think would be very popular as opposed to maybe a subscription model where you're asking restaurants to sign on for your service. This is like pay for performance. You're, if you're not providing a service to some of their customers, nobody makes any money. But the more customers that learn about it and use it and decide to upgrade, the better it is. So the question I have is, are you a standalone app or are you uh, partnering with some of the reservation systems that the restaurants are currently using? How are you approaching that piece of the technology? Absolutely. And I don't know if there's a you know opportunity post to, to show off some of the product um, as it is very beautiful. Um, but quite simply, the restaurant keeps their existing table management system. So we're not competing with, you know, the open tables of the world, the talks, the resis as they, those are still their operating system for their total table supply. But what's great is we build this unique application that sits on top of that system. So think of it from the restaurant's perspective. They're like, okay, we have 20 amazing, you know, we have 20 tables that we think are highly coveted. And again, everyone has their own preference. So, but they, they put those tables on our platform and we sell those ahead of time. Now, the great part about this is it's not that you have to download tables and you don't, it's not, you know, we have to, we don't as a company have to go and spend millions of dollars trying to get you to find tables. We put that right on the restaurant's reservation page on their Instagram and they link it through Google. So now if you go to, um, you know, one of our restaurant partners, uh, a great, great group is uh, the Roca Core Group. Um, they piloted their San Francisco and Scottsdale location. And when you go right on the reservation page, you can't miss it. It's a big graphic walking through. And even when you click on the reservation button, um, it what it does is it asks you a question. Hey, do you want to upgrade your seat? Go through tables or no, thank you. I have no preference. Go through open table. Simple as that. Very nice. You know, if I was going out for a special occasion where I really, if I cared where I was sitting, you know, if I'm just running out for dinner, quick meal, I might say, oh, I'm, I'm not, I don't need to upgrade. But on those special occasions where you do care and you're making the reservation, you've got certain people or business entertainment, if you're taking some clients out or you need to have discussions, you certainly do want that more coveted area. I really like that you're working cooperatively with the restaurant's current reservation system. I think that's another great selling point for tables. If I was a restaurateur, my parents used to own a restaurant actually down in Florida. Uh, they, they don't any longer, but that sounds like a really great idea because there were certain places people wanted to be in the evening when there's live entertainment. You know, they kind of wanted to be closer to where the live entertainment is, or if they needed a quiet corner, they wanted to be further away. So like you said, um, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, depending on who wants that. What else do we need to know about tables that you haven't told us yet? You know, I think going back to your initial point of, of, you know, this integration is that it is so tough as an operator to manage all these systems simultaneously. So, you know, something that we realized right out of the start is that we didn't want to have another tablet at the host stand, another ordering system, right? You know, they, they have all this technology. I think the future where we're looking in certainly past web two into web three now even is how do you integrate these in, into these seamless systems that are sharing data and sharing transactions that, uh, that make life better for everyone. And, and then certainly everyone gets their equal share and cut, which I think is so important. And I think the other point you brought up is, is about occasions. You know, something that we'll say is there's a, there's a table for every occasion um, and, you know, depending on where you want to go out. But we also know that this isn't for everyone. And we also know it's not for every restaurant. Um, we, we do respect the fact that not every restaurant is going to want to upgrade a table. But the good news for us and our business is that, you know, there are many that do. Um, you know, by our calculations, almost 40% of all full service restaurants um, have an app, absolute application for this. It's not just fine dining. We have had sports bars now use this, uh, local scratch kitchens, you know, these places where, again, it's about supply and demand, right? If you're, if you're a restaurant that only has 10 tables, well, those tables, 10 tables have to be worth significantly more. And you have to make sure that you're making that on that. And for sports bars, where you see a huge fluctuation in demand based on events, well, same thing, that group of 10 friends that want to come in and watch a, a game, well, you have to make sure that they're ordering more than just a couple of pitchers and some nachos, because what that group is actually purchasing isn't beer and nachos, they're purchasing the real estate to sit there and watch that game. Um, and I think that is the real transition that if the, that we're hoping to be the catalyst, of course, for that, and we're seeing that already um, within, you know, these initial beachheads. But I think from the user standpoint, I think what will get really exciting is, is that it starts with that upgrade, but we have envisioned a whole new way that you can experience, 
you know, picking your table, going out and learning about these restaurants um, within these 3D environments, not only can you upgrade that table five, but we actually have capabilities where you can see live streaming coming down or like what, you know, someone who had enjoyed that table, had TikTok that table, had shown an Instagram, what was that atmosphere at 8 p.m. on that night, um, on a Saturday night? You know, that type of social engagement, I think, is going to continue to round out what is so different about our experience versus just clicking on some boring widget and saying, oh, I'm going out for dinner at 7 p.m., now you can really be a part of that experience before you even sat down. And I think that's only going to, again, make sure that you get what you want. Because as you said, with, you know, with your kids, you actually don't want to be next to the couple that's on their 10-year anniversary date and, and driving them crazy. You're like, no, actually, I want to put my kids in the middle of the dining room. Um, and when I'm out with my husband, I want that table. So this notion is only going to improve. And, and something I often joke, you know, coming from the restaurant space myself, we, we often say we're, well, we're an industry built on guest experience, guest services, we're a guest service driven business. But what does that mean, truthfully? Is it, yeah, getting, uh, you know, making sure that their, their coffee is topped up? Absolutely. But, but what does modern guest experiences look like? Well, I think the restaurants, restaurant industry at large has really fallen behind what that is because when you make a reservation, unless you voluntarily told us that it's your anniversary, we have no, and that's the only data point we'll ever get on. We don't know your dietary preferences. We don't know your, your, your spending limit, what you're looking for. And never mind the fact that, you know, we often joke, imagine if you went to a restaurant and they say, you're, you're just getting chicken tonight. You're like, well, what if I don't want chicken? So I, there's so much room here to create, you know, what we think is, is ultimately you know, a beautiful and you know, the, not just the future of, but the present um, guest service tool that, that just will change the way your relationship with finding a restaurant will be. Yeah, Fraser, I mean, what I'm hearing here when you were talking a few minutes ago that I wanted to say was the really the environment is what you're selling. It's it's the environment that someone's seeking for whatever experience they want to have. And that that's some of what you're helping them identify. I really like the the integration of some some live video or some what does that look like what what am I going to see if I'm sitting here you know what's my view of the large tv for the game if I'm at this table what's that look like and if you get some people streaming those kind of things that's that's fabulous but the other side of that from my you know geeky tech brain here is the analytics that you can start collecting on your users that then the restaurants can use to help further define you know where their best advantage is do i want to have more areas of my restaurant that have this kind of experience or am i having more people book this kind of experience cuz lots of restaurants have large seats have distinct areas in their restaurant, you know, one's by the bar and the entertainment, they've got tables in there, the other one's quieter in another part of the restaurant, and they could get some analytics about about that. Not only that, I'm getting excited, they're guests that show up, where are they going? Are they going to the same place every time? And you can kind of offer that, you know, you can get into some preferences for some of your guests. So they're not going to have to be choosing every time you can make some recommendations based on your last preference, you might enjoy table number nine. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just thinking outside the box here. Well, and, and if you if you think about it, you know, where big data has failed in our economy is when, again, the alignment issue is, you know, when we when we saw what happened with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, it was, well, I, I didn't consent for my data to be sold to an agency that then is now sending me political ads from Russia. Like that is not what I, I was using Facebook for. But, you know, I want a restaurant to know that I like a booth. Like, this is not me. There's, there's, this is not me trying to hide my data. I actually want a better experience. And I'm willing. I'm absolutely. I'm actually trying to get the restaurant to learn more about me. And I think that really goes back to, you know, to the point we're discussing around what is guest services? Well, it, it is about matching the expectation of that experience to the, the preference of that guest. And that is also at its core economics 101, it's called the utility curve, right? So everyone has a utility curve and, in you know, maybe, maybe to you, you know, paying $10 for tables outrageous and you would never do it. But to me, that's a bargain and a half. I'd pay that every night of the pay week. 20. I'd pay 20. And some people, as we know, in certain, you know, we, you know, the one area of hospitality that has done this relatively well from is of course clubs and, and, and upgrading, but it's such a niche and it's such a different feel when you're trying to go to Vegas to buy a, a, a you know, a day better beat bottle. It, it, we know that we're, we know we're getting gypped, but we know that's just part of the experience. I, I think for, again, for 
almost 100,000 plus restaurants that day to day could benefit from this. Um, it's such a it's such a different story and such a different feel for a user than knowing that they're just being forced into this type of overt luxury that comes with some of these these you know maybe bigger resort clubs that have figured out that but it also really isn't also isn't really pegged in reality to the average person you, you know be it middle income to higher income that you know certainly is the target demographic for this if, of course if you know you're in the, the fortunate position that you can dine out at some of these restaurants on, on a regular basis so i think that's i think that's a big thing um where I guess experience those economics again line up really well and when you just see it, it it's again they're just last of the party like yeah every everywhere it just you just start think realizing yeah everything is premium customization and there's nothing wrong with that um as long as you know as long as it's transparent in my in, the, in my opinion well, I can't wait to see tables expand and come to my area. I'm really looking forward to that. I think your future is really bright. I'm so appreciative of you coming on the Future Foodcast to share your vision with us. Not only your vision, but all that you're doing right now, which is very exciting on its own. But there's, there's so much opportunity out there for you. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us, Fraser. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcasts. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry. 